Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled, Choosing Best System to Answer Your Question. What question are you looking to answer? This is part one of our five-part series on organoids. In this series, you will be better equipped to answer the basic questions and feel enabled to get started using 3D culture systems. I'm Christy Jewell of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more about our sponsor, click on the Thermo Fisher logo at the left of your screen. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to present today's speaker, David Cunninger, Director and Group Leader, Thermo Fisher Scientific. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. David, you may now begin your presentation. Okay, and uh, thank you for that introduction, Christy. Um, so um, with that, I will uh, I'll start with uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, and that's going to be the introduction um, uh, to an overview of 3D biology, um, discussing organoids, spheroids, and applications relative to traditional 2D culture. So moving on to our first slide. Um, so this, this is really just taking a snapshot of the, uh, you know, the, the field in terms of publication. Um, the publications that are, um, uh, you know, keyword searching under uh, 3D models. And what you can see is that there's a fairly substantial ramp up um, over the last um, decade or so. And a, a few of the key uh, highlights um, or representative um, uh, sort of key discoveries along the way are highlighted here. Um, just notably, um, work identifying um, one of the adult stem cell markers, uh, LGR5, uh, in 2009. And then um, more advanced, uh, more recent and advanced work um, showing um, the IPSC derived um, uh, uh, mini brain type structures, more complex cortical or, or neuronal structures that are uh, formed using these approaches. So. Um, uh, lots of interest, lots of growth, uh, lots of excitement in the field, and um, really uh, just, you know, I think a, a lot more uh, substantive advances to come. Okay, so, so what, what is a 3D model? And, you know, I, I think I'd uh, preface this and say this is, uh, you know, a, a culmination of a number of viewpoints. Uh, I think that there is not exactly a single hard and fast um, uh, rule. Um, but, but, you know, this is, you know, again, we've got to sort of frame the discussion and have a, have a you know, kind of a ground ourselves in, in language and terminology. And so that's what um, this slide is meant to do. And so, so really, uh, what do we mean by, you know, 2D? Uh, and this is really just traditional monolayer culture. So shown on the left where cells are grown um, adherently um, on, on plastic. And as we start to transition into, um, you know, 3D models, these can be, um, both, you know, not non-adherent models, which are shown more in, in, in the center, so with the spheroids or organoids, um, or into more complex systems uh, that can be interconnectedness of, of different, um, you know, tissue models, these so-called organ, organ on the chips uh, type of um, culture systems, as well as uh, printing, bio, bioprinting, I would broadly fall in this, uh, in this category. Um, yeah, so we'll get into some more, uh, some more sort of details and definitions of, um, you know, how one might subdivide or think about uh, these various types of structures as we, uh, as we keep going. Okay, so with that, um, so yeah, what, what are, um, these are maybe the two main flavors of uh, 3D models that, that one uh, hears about. Um, 
or referred to oftenly. These are certainly not the only types of 3D models, uh, but, but certainly a common ones. And so I thought it'd be useful to include these, uh, this slide as a, as a way of help to differentiating or helping define um, sort of uh, uh, contextually how these, uh, these different types of um, uh, cell structures can, can be different. And on the left, we've got um, spheroids. It's kind of a, a, a definition, um, you know, a fairly verbose definition uh, on here. That, that's, that's really, um, I think the, the, the essence of it is that it's an aggregate of cells. Um, typically, well, they, they can be a single cell type or multiple cell types. Um, and uh, they generally will not self-organize in, uh, in forming more complex or tissue-like structures. I mean, they'll organize a bit in, in forming uh, actually the aggregates, um, but, but they tend to not be um, to generate much more complex structures. And, and we'll talk about some specific examples of, of spheroids, um, monoculture spheroids uh, a little bit later and, and highlight some of the reasons why, um, you know, they, they, there are, they can be advantageous versus uh, 2D. Um, and then uh, on the right, the organoid definition, and these are really, um, Organoids, by a working definition, tend to be uh, generated from cells that um, have uh, well have stem cell properties, whether they're pluripotent or whether they're adult stem cells. Um, that is one of the sort of common themes with organoids that you're starting with uh, a stem cell that has the ability to self-renew, to grow, and also to differentiate into uh, at least a number of different cell types, depending on on the lineage and where the, the stem cell comes from. Um, and uh, part of this process of growth and differentiation uh, comes with self-organization. And so that's where um, uh, these uh, more complex organ and tissue-like structures that, that recapitulate in many ways aspects of developmental biology uh, can form when the stem cells are cultured in a, in a specific environment. Um, so um, yeah, so that's uh, I think in, in a broad uh, painting with a broad brush, that's, uh, that's how we consider, that's how I consider uh, the, the, the key differences between these types of uh, uh, 3D structures. Okay, so going into the next slide, um, so this is uh, slide five. Uh, so one of the key, sort of a common step in uh, the, the forming these 3D structures, whether they're spheroids or or organoids is the aggregation step. So you're, you're typically starting with cells that are um, uh, uh, individual uh, individual cells. They could be coming off of a you know sort of trypsinized off of a off of a, a monolayer dish, or uh, perhaps even straight from tissue or from sorting or from some other method. So so you start with essentially singularized cells. And those in the, the four blocker image here, those are for each quadrant, those are the, the, the individual cells are shown um, uh, on the left side. Um, and then uh, you basically set up um, an environment that promotes aggregation. And uh, there's four, four methods are shown here. These certainly aren't the only ones. These are sort of commonly used or relatively commonly used. Um, one uh, the upper left is sort of a hanging drop method where you have cells uh, in suspension um, that's could actually be a hanging drop or a uh, or the bottom of a of a culture dish, where you basically let the cells uh, cells uh, aggregate on their own based on either the fluidic properties or the sort of shape of the flask. Um, so they'll just settle down and and sort of uh, come in contact with each other. This will drive uh, aggregation for many many cell types. Um, moving over from the top left to the right. Uh, there's other ways to do this. You can, um, again, we can gently centrifuge cells into, into pellets uh, to help uh, drive aggregation. Um, again, these are all going to be in plastic ware that, or, or, or culture vessels that um, uh, you want to have uh, either coated for either, that, that are non-adherent. So we don't want the cells to actually stick uh, to the plastic or to the vessel, but, but to themselves. Um, and then uh, the lower half of the figure shows two different um, sort of larger scale approaches for, for bioreactors or roller bottles where you essentially put a suspension of cells in and using cell densities, agitation, um, culture conditions, some other aspects, you can help drive uh, aggregation and scale. So that's really kind of the, the requisite first step um, in forming uh, steroids or, uh, or organoids. Um, yes. So. 
Moving on um, to slide six. So this is a, a figure that depicts um, a number of the tissues that have been reported. And this is a little bit of a dated, the slide six, a, a wee bit dated. So um, there, there, there may actually be some more updates to it, um, but, but it, it shows um, the tissue types from, from humans for which um, organoids have been established. Um, and these can be starting with, with either, uh, you know, stem cell uh, induced uh, iPSC models, the pluripotent stem cells, or, or using uh, adult stem cells, uh, which are derived from the, the tissue of, 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 of interest or as indicated here. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that on the later slides. So, you know, kind of a growing array of tissues um, that have been uh, shown themselves to, uh, to be compatible with this type of uh, bio in vitro biology. Yeah, so if we, uh, looking at, at slide seven, if we, if we look a little bit more um, sort of broadly at the types of cells that are capable of giving rise to um, organoids, um, and, and this, in this case, these are going to be cells, cells that have, um, you know, the ability to um, yeah, both, uh, you know, both expand and, and differentiate, although come back to the, the tumor lines or the exception here. Um, but, but essentially these are, um, these are, these are uh, progenitor cells or cells that have a high replicative potential. So uh, up on the upper left, so these are uh, adult stem cells. Um, uh, these are, are really, um, they tend to be epithelial progenitors. Uh, they tend to be stem cells derived from epithelial types of tissues that undergo constant renewal and have a relatively high abundance of, of pre endogenous progenitors. And so this is where from the earlier slide where we looked at many of those tissues, uh, you probably noticed that, that many are epithelial derived. And so these have been uh, thus far, um, have lent themselves uh, most readily to form, form forming of organoids. So, so the adult stem cells, these are typically from, from epithelial types of, of, of tissues. Um, below that, we've got the induced iPSC cells that can be, of course, um, uh, reprogrammed from a variety of different somatic cell types. Um, moving over to the right, upper right of this figure, uh, looking at um, the tumor cells. Uh, and, and these are cells that can be um, isolated uh, and expanded under permissive sort of 3D type uh, uh, conditions uh, appear to also be quite enabling for the establishment of primary, human primary tumor lines. And um, there's also kind of a growing body of evidence that suggests that the, the tumor, um, tumor derived cells uh, isolated and expanded uh, and, and analyzed under these conditions also retain many of the characteristics of the primary tumor that, that uh, so such as uh, uh, clonality, um, maintenance of sort of heterogeneity of the pr prim primary tumors, um, and this makes them sort of very interesting and attractive models for uh, for for disease modeling for uh, for looking at anti anti cancer therapies also. And then on the, the bottom right, this is the embryonic stem cells. So this would be the 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 yang to the iPSC yang, uh, if you will. So um, again, the bulk, and, and I would say this is, you know, this is for organoids. Uh, these are the cells that, you know, a, a, again, retain uh, the ability to, uh, to both expand and differentiate. Uh, spheroids, um, which are companion to the organoids, again, a, a much wider array of cell types can be used to form um, uh, spheroids. And I'll, I'll touch on a few of those uh, later in the presentation. Okay, so, so if we look at, um, uh, again, this is using organoids as an example, um, but but I think one generally, at least from from my own perspective, I, I think of uh, I think of spheroids as just significant as lower complexity organoids, and and that that's a bit of a working definition uh, for me. And and it, there may be examples where that isn't entirely correct, but but for the most part, I, I think it's it's probably a pretty good rule of thumb. And so. Generally, when you're forming spheroids, they tend to form quickly, relatively quickly, and they, they tend to form with relatively low complexity because of you're not, you're not, um, you have either a, a relatively, either they're monoculture, a small number of, 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 of cell types, or you're not looking at, at really uh, having complex differentiation programs unwind uh, in, in the culture setting. Uh, organi organoids are, um, are uh, can be more complex. 
uh, in the number of cell types that, that are, uh, give rise, the types of structures, the time it takes uh, to do this also. So, um, so I'm going to go kind of uh, take, taking that in mind, um, that, that bigger view, kind of run through some of the strengths and weaknesses uh, of these models. Um, and so we're looking at, again, organoid formation, either starting with a human iPSC uh, on the left or an adult stem cell. Um, really, there's, there's a lot of um, similarities uh, between, between the features. Um, again, they can, um, again, the starting material is different, so that's really the, the, the fundamental difference here. Um, also, I guess the relative developmental state uh, of these, the iPSCs tend to be, you know, fetal or embryonic like in their relative maturity, even uh, as the cells are differentiated. Starting with adult uh, stem cells, you've got, uh, you know, cells that are developmentally a little, a little further along than the iPSCs. Um, both can be, um, you know, can create uh, complex structures um, that, that, that the, the cancer models come from uh, those on the right. Um, they can be uh, expanded and banked. Um, they're they're both uh, compatible given the the expand the relatively large expansion phase of these uh, both of these cell models can be. Uh, you can undergo uh, editing, uh, correction, and you know in, in inducing uh, disease related uh, mutations, correcting them, adding reporters, um, you know tinkering with these uh, from a from genetic standpoint, uh, which enables the modeling um, disease modeling um, and, and various other applications that are indicated here. Um, looking at slide nine. So again, these are some of the, the challenges uh, that are currently, uh, you know, that, that, that investigators face as they're working with these different models. So this is the slide layout's the same. And, and, and in some ways, many of the, uh, the challenges are, are quite similar. Um, you know, one is consistency. Um, this tends to be a, a bigger issue with the IPSC derived lines as um, one can generate m much more complex cellular structures uh, than with the adults. So, so again, you've got the induced, uh, the IPSC cells are not, uh, not lineage restricted. Um, at least by, you know, by, by nature, by their, their starting point, the adult stem cell models, you know, are, are going to be more restricted to the tissue from which they were derived. So, so in some ways they're sort of develop the developmental paths they can uh, undergo are, are, are narrower and, and these tend to um, overall have a, a greater uh, consistency than, than some of the, than, than certainly with, with many of the stem cell derived models. Uh, the IPSC, sorry, the, the induced uh, pluripotent stem cell line. Um, yeah, the, the protocols um, uh, can be long and complex, uh, particularly with the stem cell derived models. Um, it, consistency is still, overall consistency um, a, can be a, a challenge. Um, again, the immaturity with the, the IPSC derived um, scale uh, is is a challenge uh, for both. I, without, I won't get into the, the details of the culture conditions or or um, how to scale at this point. Um, I know there are many people working on this, but but it's still still a real challenge. Uh, so hence the, the throughput uh, and assays. And this is really an important um, aspect that you know is, you can appreciate uh, so much of the instrumentation, assays, reagents, uh, general approaches, and, and even benchmarking data, it's all, it's all built out, or the vast majority is built out on 2D uh, cell models. So, um, you know, converting or, you know, shoehorning uh, assays that, that, you know, we're, we're used to using uh, into 3D applications um, <laughs> it can requir require some creativity. Uh, uh, and, and also uh, some real technical challenges because some things are just just very very difficult to uh, to translate directly from from 2D to 3D. And I'll, I'll touch on some of this uh, towards the end of the presentation. Okay, so um, speaking of 2D, so here's a you know if we want to do a, a high level comparison, um, or just kind of thinking about some of the key features of a, a traditional 2D culture system versus uh, versus 3D. Um, and, you know, and so in some ways, you know, why would you want to 
you know, 3D, I hear a lot about 3D, for example, but, you know, how can I use it? What, what, where, what's the value uh, for the, the types of problems that I'm looking at? And, and this slide is, uh, again, adapted from um, uh, a paper that's a, a few years old now, and I think uh, maybe it's a, a bit of an oversimplification, but, but, but I, I think it does kind of give you sort of the, the broader, uh, broader comparison of uh, 2D and 3D systems. And so you can, I won't read the entire slide. You can uh, you can you know, kind of walk through it here. But you know, looking at uh, you know just sort of morphology, um, you know, time to create models, um, overall uh, applications with with drug screening, with different types of assays, cost, etc. So you can you know you can start to think about um, you know really the fundamental drivers, or at least the the thought um, the thought the wish and and the promise of the 3D models are they're going to be more representative of uh, in vivo situations, uh, which are you know, uh, you know where where we have cells in a not typically not growing on plastic, but but in a three-dimensional uh, environment. Um, now, you know, one, you might, one might consider that um, you know in in vivo there's a lot of other interactions. Um, you know how cells. How systems are interconnected, how cells and tissues and uh, how communication works, how feeding and nutrient delivery works it's all uh, you know we're still a ways from from actual physiology, but um, generally cells can adapt a more uh, you know normal phenotype or more normal like more in vivo like phenotypes uh, in uh, in three d um, again, the three d cultures can take an, a, a long time uh, to form uh, you know uh, to, to, to form mature and be able to use. Um, there are complex structures, so this again provides some um, uh, challenges with uh, certain types of um, assays, uh, particularly again, uh, lack of validated assays uh, or say a, a paucity of them as the, uh, you know, as, as protocols, as, as the 3D systems are becoming more readily. Um, a more reliably made um, as you know sort of appropriate benchmarking data is, is being generated as we just get a better better sense for really where are the times that, that the models are going to make the most sense to use and other times that they, the 2D systems may, may be adequate. So I think from my perspective there's still um, you know we're still kind of defining what are what are what, when does a particular model make the most sense? And you know, again, I think you could use a, a table like this as uh, as a way to help help define that. Because certainly, from from a from a model complexity, from a biological complexity, the 3D models are are, are very attractive. But they they take a long time uh, generally to make. They have generally more inconsistency uh, than the 2D models. Uh, they're more expensive generally, typically because of time, but sometimes the, the types of reagents that are used too. So, so again, it's, um, there's a, I think it, it really depends on the type of question you're asking, uh, the time frame uh, that you're working in, and, and some budgetary constraints also are consideration. Um, so, okay, so uh, moving on to slide 11. So I'm uh, showing here, um, this is really just kind of thinking about one aspect of uh, biology and, and where you know organoids and spheroids may, may be helpful, and, and that's that's within the the drug discovery uh, a process uh, a pipeline, if you will. So uh, this is a bit of a complex slide, but but I think it, it conveys some interesting points. And if you start at the top and, and working down, it's really you know when you when you're looking at um, during drug development, there's there's typically you know kind of an upfront uh, you know tar target ID and then a screening process um, that that where you'll you know sort of winnow down a, a fairly substantive number of, of pot potential drug uh, candidates um, where you know you really need throughput and you want to be able to make a good good selection choices and then once you start to to winnow that list down. You want to come in and you know and, and say what are the what are what are the most efficacious compounds? You know this is sort of the the, the lead optimization preclinical work. You start to do some of the early toxicity, um, and then and then getting into your you know your 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 phase studies, your clinical studies. So, you know it, it uh, organoids 
and steroids um, have promise uh, in this workflow. And I think, you know, right now, it, it, it once, I think it remains to be seen if we, we get better predictivity on, on, on the targets and um, at a, at a, you know, at a large scale, although there's, there's an awful lot of interest uh, in this right now. Um, clearly there's been the use of organoids and the cancer tumoroids, um, if you will, uh, for personalized medicine or doing uh, drug screening, uh, sort of uh, real time or, 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 or both not only screening, but looking for therapeutic optimizations while a patient is you know, undergoing palliative care is, is happening now. So, so there's some, you know, some sort of very exciting aspects here. How scalable this is, uh, can we start to use these in more predictive, you know, sort of uh, safety testing and, and as well as speeding, either re reducing the number of animals or, or speeding, you know, the, the, the route to the clinic is, um, uh, these are all promising applications. I, as far as I know, they're, you know, this is an area of active uh, uh, investigation. Um, so, you know, I think we're, we're on the path to saying exactly where, you know, where organoids fit. Um, really where their real value, value is going to be in this workflow, but, but certainly there's a, there's a lot of potential. Okay, so with that, I'm going to move into a, a few specific examples of uh, either from uh, work we're doing uh, at Thermo Fisher Scientific or uh, just highlighting work that's been, uh, been done in the field using uh, various sort of uh, 3D spheroid or, uh, or organoid models. Um, so the first, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, hepatic uh, spheroids. So uh, these are going to be um, specifically aggregates of uh, hepatocytes, or uh, this is actually a slide that's showing a hepatic cell line, a hep G2 cell, um, but, but the concept is, is similar for, for primary hepatocytes, and I'll show you some data on the next slide. But, but really just to orient ourselves, so the, the cartoon on the left is um, a depiction of um, you know, what, what a cartoon depiction of what a, 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 a spheroid of, of, of cells is like and um, what you can have at the core. Um, so it's a really a, a, a dense ball of cells. They tend to, they, depending on how one forms them, they start small, they can proliferate, um, and then uh, sort of get to varying sizes depending on, on, the, on the sort of the, the seeding, how you start and how long you culture the cells. But, but at the core, um, once the, the, the spheroids get large enough, you run into um, the diffusion limits. Uh, basically, you, you end up with cells that, that, that can't, um, uh, don't have access to uh, uh, nutrients, can't process waste uh, accurate, well, and, and end up uh, dying. Or so you have this sort of core necrotic zone. Um, you have outside of that an area where the cells are not um, are, are quiescent, so not actively growing, but, but not dead, at least by, by some standard measures. And then um, the outer core, um, where you have this sort of proliferative zone. And, and as the little, you can see these little kind of balls, the different uh, little, little blue balls or black balls indicate, um, you know, uh, uh, nutrient uh, metabolites coming in and, and out. They basically diffuse in and out. So, so you have some size constraints as, as these are not vascularized. Uh, nutrients and waste have to uh, diffuse in and out. This causes um, you run into some sort of physical constraints. Um, on the right, um, this shows an image. Uh, this is uh, taken um, of a, uh, this a Hep G2 cells that were formed. Um, they're forming these aggregates, and what you can you can see that the zones are indicated in the arrows. Um, the blue. This is basically just a nuclei stain. So each of the little round. Uh, you know, each of the little, uh, the blue spheres is a nuclei for a cell. Um, and then in the center, you can see the necrotic core. So this was usually one of our, our long dead stains to assess the, um, the integrity of cells in the sphere. And so consistent with the cartoon model, we see a bit of this sort of interior region that is um, uh, dead or dying, at least um, under these conditions. Okay, so, um, so why would we want to form human, uh, you know, uh, hepatospheres or spheroids? Pr pr these would be taking, uh, these would be starting with the primary human hepatocytes. Um, the workflow is shown on the right uh, here. So we would actually take a, a vial of frozen cells, plate them in a, a ultra low attachment round bottom a plate. In this case, we use our, our NUNC sphera plates. 
and they form um, they'll um, they'll form um, spheroids or aggregate and self-assemble into these spheroids spheroids over uh, five days or so. Um, one of the main reasons why uh, this is useful uh, with hepatic biology is that um, typically human primary hepatocytes um, it cannot last in, uh, it can't be cultured for, for very long. In fact, um, f five to six days is very typical. After that, they lose activity, they lose viability. Um, in contrast, uh, the hepatocytes, the same cells when cultured as spheroids can uh, retain viability and appropriate activity um, for weeks. And, and this is, um, this is uh, uh, advantageous um, because uh, here's a graph showing uh, one of the key activities. Um, but but for hepatic biology, you may have compounds that uh, that are they're low turnover compounds, so that they take a while to be days uh, on the order of days to be metabolized. And um, you'd like to have a culture window um, in which you could basically assess the turnover of, of of all sorts of compounds, not just those that you could measure within. A, basically a five-day window that one can do now with the, with the primary plate of hepatocytes. So, so again, this is one where you get um, improved activity. Um, so this is showing, uh, if I look at the bottom left, we're looking at um, a cytochrome P4, P450, um, the subtype, the, the 3A4 um, isoform. Um, its activity is uh, greatly improved. Um, in spheroid culture, and then this is maintained uh, even higher than the, 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 the monolayer cultures out, out to three weeks. Uh, similarly, we'll look at uh, albumin production, a key marker of the, the quality of the, of the cells, of the hepatic cells, uh, all much higher in the, in the spheroid uh, versus the, the exact same cells cultured in monolayer. And, and in this case, we're looking at, um, uh, this is uh, again, SIP uh, 3A4 uh, levels. Uh, over time, so um, yeah, so th th again, this is a case where we we get uh, in culturing the cells of spheroids, get uh, better viability, better longevity, and greater sensitivity to to certain uh, you know metabolites and, and pathways that that are really important for for folks looking at uh, you know drug safety, drug testing, ADME, uh, tox type works. Um, Okay, so that's just a touch on that. So I'm gonna give you another example. Um, uh, this is using an iPSC uh, cells uh, for, uh, for investigating uh, molecular aspects of Parkinson's disease. And so just a, a quick bit on Parkinson's. It's a, uh, it's a degenerative, um, it's a very degenerative disease. Um, that, that's uh, caused by the uh, loss of a specific subpopulation of neurons that, that emanate from the, from the, the, the uh, emanate uh, from the substantia, well, emanate into the substantia nigra. Um, and uh, these cells are, um, they're, they're a subpopulation of the dopamine producing neurons, um, which the loss of these cells are really what drive the pathophysiological conditions of Parkinson's disease, which is, a, you know, for a, um, a, a, a fairly common and uh, really quite awful neurodegenerative disease, and it, it's an area of, of intense focus. Um, so one of the ways, and this is this is work that we're, this is really um, laying out a roadmap of, of how we're looking at doing some studies in, in 3D. And, and this is uh, in part leveraging uh, moving from 2D reagents and culture systems into 3D and seeing how, you know, how can we use, uh, the, can, can we learn new or interesting things about the disease and um, ways to potentially intervene or, or, or screen candidates for potential therapies um, in 3D that we were not able to, to uh, you know, that would be unique than, than with the 2D system. Um, and so specifically, this is a, a bit of an outline of what uh, the workflow uh, looks like. And this is, this is actually something we're working on uh, in-house right now. But, but we'd start with, in the case of uh, the IPSC lines, we could start with a, a wild type, a, a, 
an individual with a normal, uh, a healthy individual without Parkinson's, and then um, individuals or more specific uh, mutations that are associated with, with Parkinson's disease and, uh, the, at the upper left. So we're looking at the LRRK2. This is a LARC2 uh, kinase. There's a one familiar mutate. Well, there's, this is a mutation associated with the disease. There's another one, the instanuclein A, that, that's listed below. So, so these are just basically uh, iPSCs derived from uh, patients with Parkinson's disease. We can, um, using a, a kit we developed a couple of years ago to create these uh, very specific midbrain floor plate uh, derived uh, dopamine precursors, um, expand the progenitors, and then put them into, in, into spheroid, put them into um, an extended 3D phase. In this case, this would be after they had been specified to be neurons or neural precursors. Um, and then what we want to do is look at, um, you know, look across the different uh, patient cohort and then stress the cells in a variety of ways and then looking at, at various endpoints. And this is just, I, I think, kind of highlighting both some of the challenges and opportunities of, of dealing with the cells in these types of structures. Um, so uh, looking at the bottom left, where we'd be um, uh, replating the spheroids and watching and then assessing how the neurons uh, uh, grow out of these spheroids uh, across the different uh, patient cohorts. We can look at very specific uh, uh, cell migration. So we can look at over, overall neurite outgrowth. We can actually track migration specifically. Uh, then we can start to uh, you know, so optically slice into these um, uh, different conditions and different cells. Um, uh, then uh, the other paths for us are the, the more destructive or uh, d dissociative ones where, where we can actually enzymatically uh, digest, uh, liberate uh, the cells from the spheroid, uh, do uh, either R, so individual RNA, uh, single cell RNA-seq, uh, fax analysis once we've got these cells individualized, uh, and, and then also leverage, uh, you know, RT-PCR and other, other types of uh, we can actually do some some histology on these too. So so this gives us you know kind of a roadmap on um, how we how we're thinking about um, leveraging um, you know the the ability to put these cells in 2D and assess features that are uh, related to the different genetic um, you know patient populations with with responses and looking at these uh, say these TH these uh, tyrosine hydroxylase or dopamine producing a cell type specifically. So something we're very excited about, uh, about doing. So if I uh, switch gears a little bit now, moving into the, um, some examples of the adult tissue derived uh, organoids. Um, so this is circling back a bit. So, so, so what do we, so, you know, what are, uh, what, what does this really mean? Um, so, so it's essentially harnessing the ability to uh, capture, isolate, or a clonally sort of outgrow um, uh, resident progenitors, uh, so tissue-specific progenitors. And, uh, you know, a number of the, uh, the tissues are shown here. Um, these can also, um, you know, so, so these types of organoids can be derived from these tissues from normal uh, and diseased uh, or a cancerous tissue. Um, so again, very, very powerful tools to enable um, the study of developmental biology to, you know, to, to re recapitulate these tissues for, for, for disease modeling and, and for, uh, you know, cancer oncology studies specifically. Um, you know, the, ap the applications for the organoids are broad. Um, this shows um, again, you know, many different uh, ways one could think about using them. Um, again, I think I touched a little bit on the personalized drug development. Um, there are potential, you know, at least certainly interest in, in therapeutic applications of the organoids, although I'd say these the days are still uh, early now, but, but certainly a lot of promise there. Um, so going, you know, going back into people or, or informing about, um, you know, uh, informing clinical, uh, informing and guiding clinical de decisions, um, as well as being used therapeutically. Uh, the right paths are more of the sort of in vitro applications of these. So, so, so really uh, quite diverse uh, and, and exciting to see where, where, you know, the field is going. And uh, 
where it will go. Um, the next slide just highlights two, you know, real world examples of the value of these uh, of these adult stem cell models um, in in therapeutic applications. Um, so this is uh, actually work from uh, different investigators in in the Netherlands. Um, one um, showing um, uh, basically it's really in, in, both papers are actually really really quite. Uh, Quite amazing, um, but uh, the the functional see the paper on the left here was essentially using uh, patient derived intestinal organoids to screen uh, for a, basically a practical screen of of drugs or uh, therapeutic agents uh, to treat um, cystic fibrosis, and, and in ways that that essentially the drugs could be that the therapy could be screened ex vivo um, to look for uh, to, to to better fit a, a, a patient's individual patient's um, genetic background or susceptible or ability to uh, respond to the different compounds. So so, so really pretty pretty remarkable uh, uh, application of this. And and the other on the right is, is really looking at um, kind of a, a paper demonstrating the uh, fidelity in which the the Cancer derived, at least breast cancer derived tumoroids um, recapitulate the primary tumors and and thus become uh, you know interesting and 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 at least somewhat faithful models for studying uh, oncology there that that uh, is not uh, it, it's hard to do and, and it, it really can't be done in, in standard 2D so, so really really neat stuff. Okay, and again, I, this is uh, this is just a, a figure taken from um, some of the, the CFTR work that shows one can actually go in and correct, uh, edit uh, the CFTR associated mutations um, with a CRISPR-Cas9 approach, um, uh, then screen these these edited uh, patient uh, patient at patient corrected cells. In um, in the uh, organoid assay and show and they show a sort of a repair the, the loss of disease phenotype so so kind of a proof in concept for repair. Um, okay, so uh, lastly, the uh, what I wanted to go over was just uh, the char characterization and analysis of of these uh, complex structures because this is really not a trivial thing at all. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, many. Um, there's a lot of adapting 2D methodology to 3D biology, and it, uh, in some cases, leaves, leaves uh, quite, quite a bit to be desired. Um, so this is certainly an area where uh, much work and development is, uh, is needed. Um, but, you know, I, I think one of the things um, that uh, sort of goes without saying is the quality of your material uh, is critical, your cellular material. So, so in this case, uh, you know, if you're, you're starting with IPSC or pluripotent stem cell derived models, um, the, the, you want to have pluripotent stem cell, you want to have high quality cultures before you start these, these long, long expensive uh, experiments. You want to know that the, the material going in is of, you know, highest quality. And so um, with, with IPSCs, you know, we, we, we uh, Thermal Tissue Scientific offers a variety of tools that helps you assess uh, the, the pluripotency of your cells. Are these, are they, um, you know, are they pluripotent and does the line uh, have the ability to give rise to all, all three uh, germline? So, so key, key features of an of a, a IPSC cell. So we have our, uh, both a pluritest uh, and TACMAN scorecard to address uh, pluripotency and the ability to, to give rise to various uh, uh, germ lines. And then uh, the karyostat, this is um, a, a digital uh, karyotyping um, uh, tool. And, and again, this is a, a way to assess uh, genomic in integrity of your cells, uh, particularly important with, with iPSC cells that have that be unstable, genetically unstable. Um, so, as I mentioned a couple of times, these are long protocols. So the ability to do in-process uh, sampling and, and QC is, is really quite useful. Um, here's a couple of examples that, that, that we, we commonly employ depending um, on, on the, the type of cell and, and the length of the protocol, but uh, visually monitoring um, 
the aggregate formation. This is a relatively simple and straightforward one. Um, we can, you know, we do this with uh, with our EVOS imaging system. Um, one can, can can do this using a variety of methods. Uh, it's a very good and relatively simple and uh, uh, low uh, low complexity way of, of getting a good sense of uh, consistency overall. Um, you know, consistency between a process. If you're doing this reproducibly, are the the steroids growing? Do they have a similar size and shape? Um, are they, you know, are they consistent within within a batch? Um, all really, really important features. Um, can also pull these out if it's a longer workflow. Pull, pull them out and do a sample differentiation, or look for a key marker expression, whether it's um, by qPCR or other other means, to determine, um, you know, are the cells progressing in a way that you uh, expect them to. Um, yeah, we're, we've also have been looking at, at adapting many of our 2D cell health reagents and, and, and other tools to, to 3D applications, and, and we're finding um, that some translate relatively well. Uh, others are are a little bit uh, a little bit more challenging or, or require specific uh, workflow or protocol modifications. Uh, as, as as a general rule of thumb, the qPCR the, the approaches used there uh, translate very well. Uh, the, an the applications with antibodies depend on uh, many, many different things. Uh, penetration into uh, uh, staining and imaging these complex and sometimes rather large structures is a, is a real challenge. Um, just being able to do optical slicing in, to do either embedding and physical slicing, um, all. Yeah, depending on um, the model that you're doing, what you want to look at, um, these are all approaches that, that you may uh, may want to employ, and uh, really uh, starts to fall into the space of almost histological analysis, depending on, on the size of some of these. So, so their uh, protocol optimization for these structures is, is really is really quite uh, important. Um, I know for, for many of our cell health reagents and, and other uh, imaging and analysis tools, we at Thermo Fisher Scientific are, are putting out uh, specific application notes and guidance on how to handle and, and as well as special specialized reagents to create um, more standardized and hopefully uh, consistent uh, protocols for analysis of these types of structures. Um, again, here's uh, so many of the instrument platforms that we would be doing for 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 imaging. Um, a plate reader based uh, analysis with with some of the cell health reagents and QPCR systems um, and I think so this is I'll just leave you with a, this is a some images of these were uh, neural organoids at uh, these are just about three months old uh, that we had uh, fixed and done uh, a cry, well, cryo embedment slicing and histology, uh, immunohistochemical staining on, and so it's a <laughs> a lot of work to get to this point. Three months of culture and uh, a, a week or so of handling and staining, but you can end up, uh, you know, generating these these very lovely, very complex structures. Uh, what you'd uh, what you'd see in here, these are the formation of these sort of neural rosette or, or neural progenitor uh, rings or rosettes uh, that are that clearly are, are visible within the the larger organ. Um, okay, and with that, I'll just go to a wrap-up. Um, I hope this was uh, interesting and, and at least somewhat informative for you. Um, uh, you know, what we really wanted to, to try and achieve, or at least to, to highlight, you know, the differences in um, the types of 3D structures uh, that, that one can form, um, uh, you know, with, with different uh, types of materials or different starting points and, and how they, um, you know, compare broadly to the, their 2D brethren. Um, some of the, you know, sort of uh, uh, challenges and, uh, and, and and key parts of the workflow um, uh, with these, and and again, um, you know, what 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 we, uh, you know, what we're doing now, and, and what we'd like to see um, and, and support in the further advancement of uh, of these models and uh, in basic discovery and in um, uh, uh, clinical with with uh, with, with clinical applications. Okay, so with that, I think I will, um, I'll wrap, and uh, I think 
I can uh, go to Chrissy. I think we might have a few a few questions we can we can move into. Thank you. Yes, David. Yes. Thank you, David, for that informative presentation. We do have questions that have come in. And if you'd like to ask David a question, please click on the ask a question box located at the far left of your screen. And we'll answer as many questions that we have time for. Okay, let's get started. David, our first question. How do I tell if 3D is right for my project? It seems like a lot of work compared to traditional monolayer culture. Yeah, that that uh, that's a good question, and I I I don't think there's a there's not a simple. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that there's not a a, a, a simple answer. I, I I think from from my perspective, it's really um, it de it depends on um, you know what what you're doing, what 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 types of of questions that you're trying to ask. Um, I, I mean, maybe a, an example. I'll give you a, a specific example. This this might help. I, I think that. Um, uh, for, for example, if you are studying someone who is, you know, studying c complex, uh, let's say a, 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 a complex, a complex uh, neuro a neurological disease like schizophrenia, for example, or or um, Alzheimer's, where they're they're different. It's not. A single mutation. It's not a single cell type. It's it's a variety of, of, of cells. It's a it's a net, network disruption and and communication and interactions between multiple cell types. Um, that can be very very difficult to to recapitulate um, in 2D. Uh, you know, either creating all these different cell types individually and mixing them together, or um, another approach is to take this you know form these cortical or these these the organoids that um, will but the process of sort of undergoing development in in this sort of 3d structure will naturally form or can be coaxed to form many many of these different cell types in an architecture that at least somewhat resembles the the, the sort of in vivo in vivo uh, situation so so you can if you're studying something that's complex this is a very nice way to model something that's complex and and uh, but but that comes at a cost from, from you know kind of time and throughput so I think it's really, you know, what you're studying and does do, do the types of models, are they really going to add value, you know, relative to, to 2D? So that's, that's not a very clear answer, but that's, uh, that, that, that would be my, my two cents on it. Thanks, David. Our next question. What do you see are the major hurdles in establishing and routinely using 3D culture? Yeah, that's a good question too. I, I, not, I think to me that's a little bit more straightforward. Um, the the, uh, the again, it, it it depends a little bit on on the model that we're talking about. Um, but uh, generally, it's consistency. Um, some models are more consistent than others, though. So, so uh, consistency, scale up, um, scale. And, and I guess, you know, it scales in the eye of the beholder, so to speak, but if you want to get a sort of large scale, you know, pharma level screening on these, you, you, those are still real challenges. Um, time, some of the workflows take, again, this, this can vary depending on the model. So some of the models, particularly the IPSC derived, you know, organoid models can take months uh, to form uh, well. And so, boy, that's a that's a while. And then, then the assays again. We I touched on this a little bit in, in the slide. That the um, the the breadth of the assays can be limiting for for some of the the three D structures. So, so advancement in in imaging and other types of um, analysis tools that are more compatible for three D are, are, are is, is still a challenge. Okay. Our next question. Why are most of the adult organoids derived from epithelial tissue? Yeah, that that um, I think uh, basically. So uh, my sense on this is uh, that they are the epithelial. So these epith epithelial 
tissues in general are, are undergo constant renewal. That's just sort of you know how how they that's sort of how they're they're built. Um, so they have a relatively robust population of uh, you know stem cells or progenitors that give rise to, to you know that are just that are there for the normal health and you know sort of maintenance of the tissue. So so and, and I think they're just. And there's some commonality between epithelial cells from different tissues, so I, I think that they, um, the, the, they, the approaches that work for one epithelial cell type can broadly be applied. Not, I mean, there's there's certainly some some improvement required. Um, there's some tweaking required, but, but can be applied to other other uh, epithelial cell types. Other tissue types are a little bit. Um, Either they don't naturally regenerate as much as the epithelial cells, so I think I think the resident stem cell or progenitor population is lower, uh, or we're just not as good at at, at finding them and, and, and pulling them out of the tissue. So so I, I think you know again expect to see more improvements um, as as we understand more about these other non-epithelial progenitors. But but I, I think that's that's you know sort of my my sense of things at least. Thank you, David. Now we have time for just one more question, but I want to remind our audience that any questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by David via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Our final question for the day, let's, let's go with this one. Is Thermal Fisher Scientific developing new reagents designed to improve 3D workflows? Yeah, well, that's a question I really like. Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think we're we're trying to do. Uh, you know, we, we're we at Thermo Fisher Scientific are really you know, tool providers, and and we look to you know support uh, you know the research uh, you know researchers in you know a wider array of endeavors, and and we've been following you know kind of the evolution of or if the Evolution, but 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 you know, and as as the three D as, as the sort of this latest and very exciting wave of three D biology with, with with much interest, and so I think our our approach has been um, kind of multifold. One is you know where you know what's easy, what can, can we adopt, what 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 do we have now that can be readily adapted to either use for culture, you know, for a creation of these models or the analysis of them. So so kind of our first and. We look and see what people are doing. What, what's the field doing? And it's, it's it's for the most part taking reagents and models that were designed for 2D for the most part, and, and then applying them in 3D. So, so the first part is you know can we not repurpose but provide better guidance on current tools. Um, the second part, you know, our second sort of piece of that is, um, yeah, we've been looking actively looking at, really even across the company um, at. Uh, the development or bringing in and developing new types of tools um, that are really specific for uh, for 3D applications, whether they're improved ways to um, fix and visualize uh, these complicated structures, um, you know, applications on our uh, confocal high content imaging system or other uh, you know other 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 technical platforms uh, th that we have, which are which are, are quite diverse. Um, you know, applying them in 3D, and then uh, even maybe a little closer home uh, to home for me and my team is looking at, uh, you know, looking at developing culture reagents um, specifically for 3D applications. So instead of, for example, just buying, you know, taking a, a bottle of DMMF12 and and using it in a 3D application. What if we built the, the media or the, you know the reagents specifically for 3D applications, and and would they work better? And I, I think these are the this is the type of stuff we're looking at right now also to uh, to see how can can we make some uh, you know a range of improvements there. So so again yeah so kind of sorry a bit of a rambling answer. Um, very interesting uh, space for us. We're we're actively looking to again, provide uh, better tools and reagents for the, you know, for the research community. I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you, David. And thanks for clarifying these basic questions and enabling us to get started using 3D culture systems. Now, do you have any final comments for our audience? 
Oh, final comments. Um, you know, I would just, uh, I personally, I, I find, uh, you know, this is, it's a very, it's a very exciting time in biology right now. We've, we, you know, we've, in our sort of post-genomic era, the ability to engineer and edit and now, you know, sort of be able to create, um, you know, these very complicated structures, recapitulate them in vitro, is it's really remarkable. So I would, you know, um, the there is an awful lot of need for creative solutions and thoughtful approaches to to using these models. So I'd just say, you know, there's a there's there's a, it's an exciting time. There's a huge need, and I think it's really just your your imagination's the limit here. So I, did, you know, I can't encourage us all to to do well. And uh, yeah, so that's that's my sort of philosophical ending to the the webinar. Thanks, David. And and you do help make this even more exciting. We appreciate your time and your efforts and your research. Um, we also want to thank LabRoot and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Now, before we go, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Again, if we didn't answer your question, or if you would like to submit questions during the on-demand period, David will be responding via email to the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand through August of 2019. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's ready for a replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may, who may have missed today's live event. You will now be redirected to the second part of our series, Getting Started in 3D. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye.